In this video, I'm going to give you a description of signal detection theory in particular as it is applied to recognition memory. And I'm just going to cover some of the basics and give you some references to learn a little bit more should you want to. So signal detection theory, this is a theory that can be applied to any binary decision. So a yes, no judgment. Some examples of where it's been applied like fire alarms that sample the air to determine whether there's a fire or no fire. Uh, in radiology, for reading the x-rays to determine whether it's a, a tumor or healthy tissue. And of course, in recognition, you could be asked, was the item studied and provide a yes, no judgment, or maybe more commonly, you're just asked to identify which items are old and which items are new. In all these cases, there's a signal right there's a fire in the house there's tumors that the person has or it's an old item and the idea here is you want to detect that signal from the noise so the noise in each of these cases might just be part things in the air part particulates in the air healthy cells or in the case of recognition unstudied items so how does this work so if we're talking about recognition memory you're going to see a list of words we're talking about a laboratory situation see a list of words see pictures, whatever the studied information is. And then you have a test and at the test, you're presented items one at a time and you have to decide whether it's old or new or maybe you're making a yes, no, did you study it uh, determination. And in each case, the person is evaluating the memory signal triggered by that probe and they make a judgment. And so to make the judgment, they're gonna compare it to what's called a criterion and I'll explain a little bit more as we go on. So here in this slide, uh, imagine that what we have on the x-axis here is memory strength. So obviously our memories can vary from low to high. So that's what you have on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you have the frequency of items that fit in this memory strength category. Now over to the right there, I have some new items and some old items. Um, and what's going to happen is we're going to place these on this particular graph. But we have a criterion. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, we have to decide at what level does the memory strength exceed some criterion where we're gonna call it old. So if the item falls to the right of our criterion, we're gonna call the, it old. That's our judgment or yes, if it's yes, no recognition. If the item falls to the left of the criterion, we're gonna say that that memory strength is not strong enough for us to claim that it's old. So we would say it's new. So like I said, over to the right, we have some simulations here. So let's suppose that we studied um, you know, five items and we have a test with 10 items on it. So you have five old, five new. This just gives you a simulation. And so the new items, when they appear, they're mostly gonna be called new, but as you can see out here, and the one outlier here, we would have one new item that's incorrectly called old, but the rest of them are correctly determined new. And the same thing for the old items, we're gonna make de determinations on it depending on where they fall on our memory strength X axis here. And so everything to the right here would be correctly called old, but of course you have this old item which is missed here because it's called new. So we could do this over and over again. That would represent a very, very small sample. Of course, we're gonna have much bigger samples. And if we sample, we end up with what are called sampling distributions. Um, so we end up with a distribution and for the purposes of this discussion we're going to assume that they're normally distributed there are some models out there which suggest that maybe the old item distributions are not uh, the, at least the same variability as the new items but in this case uh, they're normally distributed with the same variability as the uh, noise distribution or the new items so on the left here you have new items they form a distribution this is what our noise is of course and to the right, you have the old item distribution, which is our signal, plus also some noise, right? That's not perfect. And in, in fact, signal detection theory is used when you have overlap in these distributions. If you have overlap, that means you have some errors or some ambiguity. If these distributions were so far apart that the signal is super clear, you wouldn't have any errors in your decision and it would be fairly obvious what the decision is and you wouldn't need the criteria and you wouldn't have to sort of evaluate things. So here we're talking about situations where the distributions um, overlap. So we can have in any um, recognition situation, we have new items and the new items uh, 
we could either call them old or we could call them new. And so if we call them old, that's called a false alarm. And if we call a new item new, that's called a correct rejection. All of the language is organized around detecting old items or detecting the signal. So the false alarm area, remember the black distribution represents the new items, it's going to fall to the right of our criterion and underneath the curve. So that's our false alarm area. And then this area would be the area of correct rejections. Now it sums to one. So let's suppose that like you had 80% correct rejections, that means you're going to have 20% false alarms. Um, so, or 0.8 and 0.2 representing each of those distributions. Now the same holds true for the old item distribution, but the names are a little bit different. So if it's an old item called old, we call that a hit. And that represents this area to the right of the criterion and underneath the curve. And if we have an old item called new, well, that's a miss. And so that's going to fall to the left of the criterion, also under our curve. That's the area um, representing that. Now these distributions overlap. So this is an image that sort of shows you the area of each one of these. And of course, the areas themselves can vary depending on several different measures. So one of the things that can vary the distributions is sensitivity. So we measure sensitivity in signal detection theory. So there's a number of measures and I have some, the, so I have the Macmillan and Creelman and the Snodgrass and Corwin sites there. Those are great sources to give you different measures of sensitivity like A prime, et cetera. Uh, but here we'll focus on D prime, which is the distance between the middle of the distributions, which gives you a measure of sensitivity. So how do we create memories of different strength if we're talking about recognition? So we can go back to Craig and Lockhart, levels of processing, and we can alter what they're doing with the information when they're actually forming memories or creating memories uh, initially. So we could do shallow encoding, which creates a weaker memory. So you could be asked the people to judge how many vowels are in the word, is it printed in capital letters, etc. And this will produce smaller D prime values. If you use a deeper encoding task, one that makes you think about the meaning of the word, like do you like the word, is it animate or inanimate, does it describe you, uh, these are all things that would promote much stronger memories and larger D prime values. So how does this work? So like I said, D prime is the sort of the measure of the difference between the distributions. So if you had really weak encoding with a small D prime, the distributions are going to be much closer together. So really what I did to create this image is I just moved the red distribution or the one uh, representing old items, made it closer to the noise distribution or the one representing new items. Different thing happens, the distributions get further apart if you have stronger encoding, so there'll be less overlap, and you can see that the area there, uh, like for the false alarms and for the misses, is much smaller. You'll have fewer errors because you have much stronger encoding. So some experimental examples. So uh, I and my student, uh, Kevin Zisch, we did a study where we were interested in weak memories. So we had people do some shallow encoding. Now we also varied the format of the test uh, that's not really that important here. And we also changed whether the item was clear or blurry at test. Uh, but as you can see here, I put the hits and the false alarms so you get an idea that the performance wasn't fantastic. It was above chance, but uh, this was a hard test because the memories were so weak. And what you see over here is a measure of D prime and these D prime values are fairly small because we were looking at a situation where we had weak memories. So let me contrast that with another um, example where I and my student uh, Bavika Kakadia, what we did is we looked at memory for actions and memory for actions creates really, really strong memories. And so here you see a graph of the uh, accuracy. In this case, they were highly accurate for source even. Uh, and over here, if you look at the D prime values, they're much larger. So it was like 0.75 in the other study and here it's uh, well above three and a half, which is a really huge D prime. But this gives you an example of how D prime can vary depending on the strength of the encoding. Now another measure is the criterion. So we can measure criterion. Now these are, have mathematical equations again. You can check out the Macmillan and Creelman, the Snodgrass and Corwin for how to actually calculate these values. There's also a package in R now that will allow you to calculate these values if you have hits and false alarm rates, et cetera. But C is a common measure of criterion. Again, there's other measures like beta. Uh, 
uh, but C is a widely used one. And a zero value of C indicates a fairly moderate criterion in that people are basically splitting their old and new responses half and half. Negative values indicate a fairly liberal criterion, that is that there's people are making more old responses overall. Positive values indicate a conservative criterion where there's more new responses overall. So how do we vary criterion? Well, typically you would use the same encoding task, so you create memories of the same strength, but you alter the way the items are evaluated. We can do it by instructions, so you can tell people before a block of items or a test, call it old if it has the slightest chance of being old, and that'll make people have more old responses. Or you can tell them call it old only if you're certain that it's old, and then that'll uh, cut down on the number of old responses. You could also do this by inducement, so you could pay people. Uh, you could give them 25 cents for a hit, uh, correct rejection, five cents, and what would happen is they would be much more liberal to respond to this uh, reward imbalance, if you will. You could flip that reward imbalance over and create a more conservative criterion. So how does this work? So here's a, um, an example with our distributions where the criterion is right in the middle, so you're going to get uh, an even split of responses. And if it's liberal, that criterion is going to shift to the left, and what will happen is you'll have more hits, uh, but you'll also have more false alarms. And hopefully you can see that the area under the red distribution here would be much larger. That's the hit area. And then, of course, the area falling to the right of this green criterion and under the black curve would represent our false alarm area. That, too, is going to get larger. Now, if we do uh, the opposite and have a more conservative criterion, what's going to happen is the criterion is going to move to the right. You'll have fewer hits but you also have fewer false alarms. And as you can see, this false alarm area gets smaller and the hit area gets smaller as well. So an experimental example of this, uh, my colleague Tim Curran uh, did a couple of experiments and what uh, we created were two conditions, a conservative and a liberal condition. And here you can see the D prime is statistically equivalent. There's a small difference there, but it's not significantly different, also the same in experiment two. But you can look at the C values are different. In the conservative condition, you have a positive C value. In the liberal condition, you have a negative C value, which maps on to uh, the signal detection theory. Now, a couple of notes about criterion. People will generally set a criterion for a test or a block of trials. But there are some situations where the criterion has been shown to vary within a group of trials. Uh, you can see the Rhodes and Jacoby or the Aminoff and colleagues uh, papers are good examples where they're demonstrating that this can happen. Uh, more and, and then also the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of times we uh, will keep strength the same and vary criterion or criterion will vary and strength won't. So there's a lot of evidence that indicates they can be independent. But there's some other cases where they interact and both of these values will change. Uh, so the Crowell, for example, uh, the D prime changed across conditions where people were making a yes, no judgment. So there's a criterion, just like I'm describing for a signal detection, but it didn't change. D prime didn't change when you had an A criterial test. That is a force choice test where you presented two probes and you uh, make a selection of which one was studied. And so this test is generally believed to not use a criterion because you're just comparing one probe relative to the other. Hirschman showed that stronger lists uh, generally had more conservative criterions and there was less willingness for them to shift their criterion with stronger lists. He also found that mixed lists, that is, you know, one that's comprised of both strong and weak items, could promote some criterion shifts. Stretch and Wicks did found that strength manipulation based on the number of exposures, so exposing the item three times versus one time, uh, altered both sensitivity and criterion. So both measures were changing. Hicks and Marsh showed that uh, as the six signal to noise ratio decreased, as you got a more difficult discrimination, you tend to have more liberal criterion. So that actually maps on with uh, what Hirschman was claiming. And Bruno Higgum and Perfect, what they did uh, is they summarized this. They did some experiments as well, and they summarized this relationship, I think, quite clearly and elegantly, and sort of pointing out that if you have a strong memory for a list, then subjects are going to ignore cues and not really adjust their criterion. So you get less shift uh, and, a, and a fairly um, conservative criterion. But if the list is perceived to be weak, even if it's not really weak, if it's perceived to be weak, people are going to use a more liberal criterion and it could be done on an item by item basis. So you could get those shifts or it could change. 
So here are the references of all of the uh, papers that I talked about. If you uh, are seeking more information, this is just meant to be uh, an initial overview to get, orient you to some of the key ideas. I hope you found it helpful.